no longer under the authority of our schoolmaster. That is, the law does, um, we're not no longer under the schoolmaster or the law, but does that mean that his teachings and instructions are any less able to guard us from physical and moral evils that it was doing um, uh, prior to? Is it any less able to cultivate our minds? Is it any less able to instill moral lessons at every opportunity? You know, see, this is something that we have to understand that, you know, even though the schoolmaster is gone, even though we've matured and moved on, you know, those lessons that we learned as a youth, even as, as us, we didn't, uh, I don't think no one here probably had a schoolmaster, uh, at least I don't think, you know, but uh, I'm sure we all had, we all had uh, uh, parents on the most part, you know, <laughs> and, you know, those lessons that your parents taught you when you were coming up, you know, those values and principles that they instilled into you, such don't steal, don't lie, you know, uh, you know, these, these fundamental principles that you were taught as, as you were coming up, now that you're grown, do you just throw all that out the window? Mm -mm. Uh -huh. You know, those are still some very valuable lessons and they still will keep you out of uh, serious trouble now today. You know, if you go around stealing from everyone, you know, you're gonna find yourself hurt, dead, or locked up. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so those lessons are still very valuable now today. You know, even though you're grown, you still should be respectful to your elders. Right. You know, something that you were taught even that as a youth, you know, but those lessons, like I say, are still valuable now today, just as the Torah is still valuable for us now today. It still has valuable lessons that uh, that it teaches us, you know, if we will, if we would um, only adhere to it. Now, just as you're grown and, you know, your mom or your parents may have a house rule that there's no cussing in the house. Well, now that you've grown, do you go to your mom's, uh, to your parents' house and cuss like a sailor? Mm -hmm. You know, you're not under their rule anymore. So why you don't just go in there and just start cussing like a sailor? Yeah, that's, right. that's out of respect and out of um, what they've instilled into you as a youth, right? right? You know, see, those things are still valuable. You know, even though it's not your parents' house, if you go to your friend's parents' house, then you go in there and start cussing like a sailor? You know, you've learned those lessons, you know, as a youth, but they're still valuable even now today. That's right. You know, and that's the same thing um, as Torah, which was the schoolmaster. You know, here it is, no, we're not under its authority, i.e., we're not made to do these things. But we do them because we know they're pleasing to our heavenly God. You know, and that's the reason reason why we do them because the same thing that pleased him yesterday is the same thing that pleases him today. Right. You know, because he's Yahuwah. He changes not. Oh, yeah, yeah. Isn't that what his word says? Yeah. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so if he didn't want you to sin back then, <laughs> then he doesn't want you to sin now today. Right. If he didn't want you to sin under the old covenant, <laughs> then he definitely don't want you to sin under the new. Yeah. Yeah. And what is sin? 1 John 3, 4 says, sin is transgression of the law. Yeah. So, yes, even though we're not under Torah, Torah is still very much valuable to us. See, and some of us didn't learn those lessons when we were a youth. Yeah. Uh -oh. We didn't come into the fold until after we were grown. So some of us need to go back and learn some of those lessons. <laughs> See, you may came from a heathenistic family, and they allowed you to cuss as a kid in, in the house. See, but when you go to a house of Yah, and you go in there, you know, cussing in the house is not going to be accepted. You know, you may have came from a household, you know, a heathenistic household, where, you know, it was doggy dog, you know, between you, the siblings, and your parents, everybody took whatever they could get. You know, they stole, and y'all fought, and, 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 and all this, that, and other. Well... Now that you're coming to the fold, you should start finding, you know, Torah will teach you the stuff that you missed as a child. Yeah. See, because I'm here, I'm here to tell you that Yah done a lot of those things in his household. Yeah. So if you're going to be in his fold, you can't go around acting like the happy heathen. <laughs> you know, you're going you're, you're gonna to have to respect the owner of the house. Yes, indeed. Amen? Amen? You know, see, and this is what Torah does for us. It gives us those lessons that we missed. 
you know, when we were coming up because we came up in a heathenistic household. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody still with me? Yeah. Yeah. Next reader, Galatians 4, 8 through 10. I'll be it then. On the other hand, at that time, when he knew not Elohim, he did serve unto them, which by nature are no Elohim. But now, after that, ye have known Elohim, or rather, are known of Elohim. How, how turn ye again to the weak and back, 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 Comment. He observed days and months and times and years. Okay. So, here it is, Paul's, he's kind of saying what I was saying. On the other hand, here it is, you have some that, that were not of the household of Elohim. So they didn't grow up, you know, knowing what, to, uh, what was pleasing to Yah, what, what wasn't pleasing to Yah, you know, and... They didn't even know Elohim. You know, they, they did service unto unto uh, them by nature were no Elohim. They were serving um, false gods, in other words. You know, but now that they have known Elohim, or that they're known by Elohim, you know, he's, he's telling them, how can you, um, again, turn to the weak and beggarly elements? You know, why do you want to, why do you desire to, again, be in bondage? You know, and again, the subject and the context of what he's, uh, the subject is uh, of the book of Galatians is a perverted gospel. And the context in which he's saying these things is to prove that, you know, you do not have to be circumcised and keep Torah in order to be saved. Mm -hmm. You know, so we must keep in mind that he's writing this in conjunction with the overall topic. Can one be saved via the covenant of circumcision and, uh, and, Rather, justification or righteousness is by the works of the, um, of the law. This is what they were being taught in Galatia by the false brethren that crept in unawares that it spoke of in chapter 2. You know, they were being taught that you can only be saved, you know, via the covenant of circumcision. You had to be in the covenant of circumcision and you had to uh, keep the Torah because that's what may, um, showed you to be righteous. You know, but Paul is writing against that, you know, because you don't have to be... Uh, have to um, be circumcised and do the works of the um, Torah in order to be saved. You know, here in the book of um, Galatians, this is what Paul is trying to convey. So, you know, yes, he's speaking against uh, some of the things that's done in Torah here, but it's in conjunction with, you know, them putting themselves into bondage via the circumcision of uh, the... Um, Circumcision, the covenant of circumcision. See, and, uh, we brought out last week, it's real important that you understand what the circumcision is. That's why they keep on uh, bringing up circumcision. It's because it's the oath, it's the sign or token of that covenant. You know, it's like the signature that on the, uh, on the bottom of a contract. You know, once you sign on the dotted line, you know, whether you read the small print or not, it's too late. You, you know, you can't, you can't take it back. See, and this is what Paul was bringing out in, in chapter 3. You know, once it's confirmed via circumcision, there, no man can disannul it. You know, so he's, he's, he's telling them, he's saying, hey, why do you want to put yourself back in, in, in bondage again? You know, if you want to keep Torah, just keep Torah. Right. You know, you don't have to enter into a covenant in order to do it. Because when you enter into that covenant... He was teaching them that they're going backwards instead of forwards because they started out in the spirit. You know, those who started out in the flesh, they have to get to the spirit. You know, but they started out in the spirit, so there's no need for them to go back to a covenant in the flesh. They already, they're already in the better covenant. You know, so Paul is not teaching that keeping of Torah is done away with, nor is he teaching that it is, it is improbable for the Gentiles to keep Torah. Rather, he's teaching that the covenant of circumcision is done away with. And that justification is no longer reckoned with the works of Torah. You know, for uh, justification is, is by, is by um, grace, is by faith in, in Yahshua. You know, and as it was imputed, 
as um, Abraham's faith was imputed to him as righteousness, so will ours be. You know, for Paul to teach the former would be against what Yahushua taught. If he was teaching them not to keep Torah or uh, to go against Torah, then he would be actually teaching against what his Adonai, his, his Adonai, his Lord, stood for. For in Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18, Yahushua make it emphatically clear. He says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, you would think that that word fulfilled in verse 17 and that word fulfilled in verse 18 are the same. But they are. In the Greek, the word fulfilled in verse 17 is play root. It means to replete. That is to fill up a hollow. So imagine, if you would, uh, a glass that's half full. You know, uh, much like this one. You know, now if I was going to replete this cup of water, I would simply take some water and I would add it until it reached all the way up to the top. You know, then that this cup will be repleted. Now, it wouldn't be completed as in done away with. It will simply be repleted, you know, filled up. So what did Yahshua come to bring that wasn't already in the Torah? Everlasting life. Yeah. See, the Torah taught one how they could be blessed upon the earth in the promised land. But what Yahushua brought is how one could be blessed for an eternity right. in everlasting life. You know, Yahushua would tell the, the scribes and Pharisees, he said, you search the uh, scriptures that you, um, in hopes that you might find everlasting life. But they are that which speak of me. See, the only way that you're going to get everlasting life is through Yahushua. That's why we have to enter into covenant with him. See, because the covenant of circumcision is a fleshly covenant. And it's appointed to all flesh to die. Because the wages of sin is death. You know, so that's all part of the plan of Yahushua's uh, to come and die for our sins. See, because everyone... Everyone that was born into the flesh is locked into sin. They're born into sin. And there's only one way out. And that's through Yahushua. And that's just the way it was meant to be. You know, and those who have faith in Yahushua will get out. And those who don't will receive the wages of sin. You know, now, look, let's take a look here. At verse 18. Matthew 5, 18, Yahushua says, Till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. He's making it emphatically clear that he did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, that being said, last I checked, the heavens and the earth had not passed. And there are still prophecies that has undeniably not being fulfilled, such as this one in Zechariah 14, verses 16 through 18, which reads, And it shall come to pass that everyone that has left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahuwah Zavo, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, Yahuwah Zavo, even upon them shall be no rain. And if the family of of Misraim go not up and come not that ha that have no rain, they shall be the, uh, uh, there shall be the plague wherewith Yahuwah will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of tabernacle. Now, if someone know if this happening or transpiring already, please let me know. But as far as uh, I know, this has not came to pass. Therefore, it is safe to declare that the adherence of Torah, the law, is still profitable for people to keep. And that no matter how one might twist Paul's writings, he was not teaching that it was sinful or bondage to keep Torah. Ironically, he taught just the opposite. Let us consider verse 12. 
Galatians 4, 11 and 12 says, I, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brother, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not entered me at all. Okay, so we see that Apostle Paul is teaching that he wants them to be as he is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Brother Paul also teaches, he says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Messiah. So he's saying, follow me as I follow Messiah. He says he's following Messiah, and they should be following him. Okay. Okay, bro. Well, we'll put in that, with this in mind, let's, let us consider how Paul walked. And just follow him. In Acts 13, verses 13 and 14, it says, And when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and Yochanan, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidah, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. What? Surely this guy that's going around teaching people not to keep Torah is not keeping the Shabbat. He's not keeping Sabbath, is he? What about Acts 18, verses 20 and 21? It says, when they desired him to tarry longer, time, speaking of Paul, when they desired him to tarry longer with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that come up in Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you if Elohim will. And he sailed from Ephesus. Did he say he must by all means keep this feast? Mm -hmm. So he was keeping the feast. He was keeping Shabbat and the feast. Acts 20 verse 6. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. He kept on leavened bread too. Acts 20, verse 16. And Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted if it were possible for him to be in Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. What? Is this the same guy that they accuse of teaching people not to keep Torah? Is this the same guy that said, Be as I am? And to follow him as he followed uh, Messiah? Well, I say by all means. Be as he was. And follow him as he followed Messiah. Did Messiah do these things? Mm -hmm. yeah. So he actually is following Messiah. Mm -hmm. And doing these things. And we ought to follow him as he followed Messiah. In doing these things. Yeah. Galatians. Fourth, verses 13 through 16, my next reader, please. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not and rejected, but received me as an angel of Elohim, even as Messiah Yeshua. Oh. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have, and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Okay, now I'm going to need you to paint, to close your eyes and pull out your, um, your paintbrush mm -hmm. and allow the scriptures to, to paint a picture for you. You know, because when you do so, it becomes apparent that the enemy was trying to portray Paul's infirmity of the flesh as an oath or uh, a sign or token of Yah showing that his perception or views were errant. You know, uh, take note as to how he says, ye know through the infirmity of the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you at first. You know, so as if, what does this have to do with anything? Then he goes on to say, and my temptation was in, the, in my flesh, ye despise, my temptation which was in my flesh, ye despise not. This word temptation is, is proving or trial. You know, this was something that Paul had to endure in and of himself. And he said, you know, you despised it not then, nor rejected it. But you received me even as an angel of Elohim, as Messiah Yahshua even. So it wasn't no problem then, but now all of a sudden it's a problem. 
You should, can everybody see that? He goes on and says, where is then the blessedness he spoke of? Now, just imagine, during the time when he first went there, you know the signs of, uh, the uh, miracle signs and wonders followed him. Mm -hmm. So here it is, he's doing these miracle signs and wonders before him, and they're embracing him, even as, as, as he's Yah, um, Yahushua HaMashiach himself. And they're saying, bless him, bless him, bless him. You know, he's, he's saying, now, where is that blessedness you speak of now? Right, right. Where is it now? This is not the time I need it. He said, you know, for our fair record that if it was possible, you'd have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. But now, they trip him because he has this infirmity in the flesh. He says, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So it's not too hard to see that the false brethren that crept in unawares was trying to use his infirmity in the flesh against him. Now, of course, that's supposition on my part, but I don't think it's a, it's a far stretch to see that. You know, it's pretty apparent by the wording that's, that, that he chose to use. Next reader, Galatians 4, 17 and 18, please. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yeah, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it's good to be zealous, affected always in a good thing, but not only when I'm present with you. Okay, now, we're going to take a look at a lot of this wording because, you know, this, this could have been better translated in, in my opinion. Um, these words, they zealously affect, all come from one, from one Greek word, they lose, number 2206, meaning to desire one earnestly. To strive after, busy oneself about him. You know, so they were desiring earnestly. The word well here is right, suitably, or properly. The word yeah is actually Allah number 20, uh, 235, meaning contrary wise. You know, uh, maybe yeah cut it back then, but I think contrary wise would make would do better now today. Uh, they would, the words they would are translated from Thelio, Ethelo, number 2609, meaning to will, to wish, to desire, to imply active volition and purpose. Uh, and the word exclude used here in 17 is Echilo, number 1576, meaning to shut out. And ye might affect is again Zelu. Number uh, 2206, meaning to desire one earnestly to strive after. Okay, so what I did was simply insert the, uh, the definitions into the text so we can get a clear reading of it. Galatians 4.17, they earnestly desire you, but not rightly. Contrary-wise, they desire to shut you out or shut, uh, shut, out, shut out you or shut you out that ye might earnestly desire them. But it is good to earnestly desire, but always in good things, and not only when I am present with you. You know, see, Paul was exposing these...